Processing Unusual Native American Woods, William Hovey Smith, 2019. I'm the owner of a knife company, Hovey's Knives of China. And what we did is go back to ancient China 3,000 years ago, when the China had the most advanced civilization in the world and made some interesting cooking knives from bronze. Well, I took inspiration from that, and we make Chinese-inspired cooking knives out of modern carbon and stainless steels in my shop in central Georgia. I'm also an author of 18 books, including a business book, Create Your Own Job Security. Now, in this book, I advocate that you start your own business as and when needed to raise whatever kind of money you need at any age, any time, any place, and you get to own and control your own destiny. My newest work is a novel, Father of the Grooms, that is set in Sicily. And in particular, uh, parts of it are set in the city of Syracuse that's shown here. One of my characters, Luigi the Claw, is a retired mafia enforcer who, as a young guy, uh, actually worked for American archaeologists and became interested in an ancient knife made by the Sicily, uh, one of the very early cultures in Sicily. And he had such a knife made out of modern materials and used it, quite frankly, as a terror weapon. And this is a knife that I'm going to be making using woods from my own property, some of which you'll see in this video. This is Hovey Smith, the Backyard Sportsman. And as many of you know, I recently installed a rather large power hammer in my knife shop. Well, that installation necessitated that I compact things in my shop. And consequently, uh, my wood collection, which included a lot of unprocessed woods that were somewhat unusual and to me, and many others of considerable value, uh, I could not justify keeping them in limbs and branches, etc., etc., any longer. And consequently, I needed to take things like this and either work them up in something usable or toss them. I no longer have the room to store them. So that's what I'm about doing now. Now, the reason I'm even bothering with a piece of wood like this, this small and this crooked, is that this is American chestnut. Not Chinese chestnuts that are growing in America, but indeed from the original American chestnuts, from a grove of live trees. Yep. A few actually survived the chestnut blight. Uh, these are very few indeed. And uh, when these trees drop limbs, then a friend of mine who's a pin maker uh, gathers things and we proceed to produce things out of them. What I want to do is salvage materials that's big enough and colorful enough to use for knife scales. And I'll show you the details of some of this. Uh, this is aged, attacked, and spalted wood. Uh, consequently, it's right colorful. But when it comes in branches like this, this is too big for me to get under my bandsaw. So consequently, I have to split it. And the same goes with this magnolia over here uh, on the chopping block. Now, magnolia is not a rare wood. It's, of course, a southern wood. We have magnolias all over the south, and they're native trees. But uh, it's also a useful knife wood. Uh, the white magnolia is what is commonly used to handle Japanese cooking knives, in case you didn't know. So we have it here wild, in abundance sometimes. So why not use it? Now that we have this wood split, our task of the day is take this pile of rough wood and to turn it into something with which I can make knife scales. 
You can see my old Craftsman bandsaw there. Now, uh, they call this a 12 inch bandsaw. Well, I don't know how they get 12 inches out of it. Uh, I can't get more than six. But at any rate, uh, that's what we got. Now, if you are going to do serious wood and you are going to bandsaw with something like this, yeah, you need something that will cut an honest 12 inches. Uh, if you're going to work logs. Now splitting like I do, I lose a lot of wood. And I think a 12 inch saw would enable me to salvage at least 25% more wood out of what I fall. So if you're going to work raw wood, yeah, you really need a larger saw. Uh, that's just the way of it. But if you're going to work pre-cut stuff, now this old craftsman works like a champ. And I know one guy who's much more experienced than I am. He's been at it for decades, and he once owned a Craftsman, and he sold it, and says he has regretted it ever since. He said it cut a zillion board feet of wood before, when, while he had it, and he sold it, and it still cut a zillion board feet of wood. So, uh, yeah, he was very well pleased with it. So if you got one, yeah, it's worth keeping up. It's worth keeping up and using. If you're going to start out new, if you're going to work raw wood, yeah... You really need access to one with a longer stroke. First thing you want to do is make sure that in fact it will clear the blade. And this will, but just barely. This end right here, which is cut at an angle, uh, you want to square that one up. So that will probably mean that you freehand it. But you adjust the fence to give you some support. So we'll leave the fence here about there I think and lock it and just push very slowly in this direction so we try to get it as parallel to this face that's already cut as we can about there I think. We made the first cut on this piece of wood here and we thought maybe we could recover something from this side and indeed we did manage to recover one uh, block here and the reason we couldn't do more is because there was a hidden hollow spot on the inside and that had to be taken away. So, uh, this goes into the discard pile, and thus far out of this piece, we've cut one piece of usable wood. From that piece that you saw me starting with in this series, that's all we got out of it. And you'll notice the top block has a wormhole in about the center. And I do not know how far that goes in. So not all of that piece uh, is usable. What is the aftermath of basically a day's work done over a two-day period? This is the waste pile of materials that I had saved to someday use for knife handles. So this I no longer have to store. It can go out of the shop and that gives me more room. Now my saw has a little room to work. I have some shelves over there for storing my knife blanks now that they're cut and separated by a fireproof wall from my power hammer 
Well, we have white hot metal flying around. And that is the reason I was so eager to make sure that this was fireproof and, and also going to put in a sand floor and I have the sand out there drying outside as we speak. We have also generated a large amount of sawdust of which this represents approximately 25 percent. I've already cleaned up twice. Now, what has been the result of processing all this wood? One of the things I wanted to do uh, with these woods is to produce some grips for some specialized knives I'm making. One of which is for my movie, Father of the Grooms. It's a knife based on an ancient Sicilian pattern. And I'm going to make up several versions. Uh, a couple of which are going to be made out of this mild steel here, which is not hardenable. But I need to have the scales full width to this steel, which is a full two inches. This is cherry wood, and this is a plank I cut. And you can see it's rough on one side yet, but it's solid, it's wide enough, and yeah, uh, I can produce a knife scale uh, from this wood without any problem. When you get down to our American chestnut, uh, we have problems arising. This piece is wide enough, but you see this crack right here. Okay, so that doesn't make it. This is some of our, this is some of our magnolia wood, which is interestingly contrasted and looks good has some interesting figure to it. Okay, now that's wide enough. That'll make it. When we're working with this American chestnut, uh, some of it's really beautiful in small sections. But the problem is trying to get something solid. Uh, here, you see we're running into bark on this edge right there. So basically, uh, only about from there up maybe is still usable. Here's a larger block of the chestnut. Notice it has a hole right here. It's a wormhole. It looks beautiful, but getting solid wood out of it is a problem. You see this crack runs right through there. And if you put pressure on that in mounting a scale, that was splinter. Now how far does it go? Well it goes at least to there at the moment. It may spread all the way across the block. So basically only from there to here is usable on this particular block of wood. So even though we've cut it small or smaller, uh, there are still problems. Here we have some wormholes, another crack, So getting something solid out of this chestnut, even though it may be very nice and beautifully spalted, uh, yeah, and it looks like you might have to use a little super glue to get along with it to actually make it work. I prefer not to, but uh, with this particular wood, that's the way it goes. When you get good solid cherry wood, this is what you can do with it. So this is a grip on one of my knives, of course. Uh, this is the largest pattern we make. Uh, our large chopper here. But, uh, yeah, the grips turn out very, very nice. Perhaps the most unusual thing I do is use wormy tea olive. And that is this material here. Uh, this is a Native American tree. Uh, it grows to tr real tree size here in the southern U.S. And uh, normally, or oftentimes, it's just known 
in the horticulture industry as a flowering shrub, but the tree version of it uh, gives this spalted wood on occasion. And when you make a knife grip out of it, what you get is a grip that looks and feels uh, something like stag or bone. It has a rough texture to it through all the wormholes. Uh, you stabilize it with uh, heavy coats of epoxy. And yeah, it makes a very interesting and unique knife handle. The blade on this knife is a scythe uh, used in the late 1700s and 1800s uh, here in central Georgia uh, to cut wheat and fodder for livestock. With all the risk, why go through all this process? Why not just buy your stuff, buy your blanks? Well, yeah, I could, and I do sometimes, but I've got hundreds of acres of trees, and they give some interesting stuff. So, yeah, I want to use it. So we go through this process and do it. As I mentioned before, having a larger size saw that you can treat larger timbers instead of having to split them will greatly increase your yield. Uh, maybe 30% or more uh, by being able to saw out materials rather than having to split it because you lose a lot of product through the splitting process as you saw. One more thing I'm going to do with this wood that I've cut is we're going to dip these ends in liquid wax and that will prevent in-grain drying checks and splits. So uh, we're going to do that. And this wood, uh, some of it's going to go in my cooker. Uh, the cherry splits, for example, will. And others of it are going to go in my burn pile, where we will still recover some charcoal from it. So ultimately, it will all be used to some degree. But now, this is Hope e. Smith, reminding you to hunt what you eat and eat what you hunt. Be legal, be ethical, be safe, goodbye, God bless, and see you next time. As each of the 17 cultures invaded Sicily, among the first things done was to rob the tombs of the predecessors. So consequently, when Luigi was working for American archaeologists, these early Sicily left very few remains indeed. But he was enamored with the style of this blade, which was described as a wavy bladed knife. We know it from the Greek descriptions. And the Greeks so feared and unfit for civilized combat and forbade its further use and production. Working unusual native woods is full of risk and rewards, as you have seen. You never know exactly how something is going to turn out. For more information on my books, blogs, and more than 750 videos, you can go to my website, www.hoviesmith.com. For more information on my knife making, you can go to Hobie's Knives of China blog.co. For information on my new book project, screenplay, and movie to come, Father of the Grooms, and how you may participate, go to fatherofthegrooms.net. Good hunting and good eating from the outdoors. Goodbye, and God bless. See you in the movies.